All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of teachers who have been with us all year long, but if you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And there's a lot to unpack with today's presentation. There's a lot going on. This is our Biodiversity Month, as many of you may know, so all May long, we are celebrating Backyard Bio, encouraging you guys to get outdoors, explore local wildlife near you, and share what you find with us. We have classes all over the globe connected with one another already. It's been such a spectacular celebration already, and there's so many days to go in the month. In a couple of weeks, too, we have our Global Biodiversity Festival, the biggest thing we've ever done, 150 programs in three days, all in support of amazing conservation organizations around the world. So please do register for that. It's going to be a fantastic time. Now, tomorrow is Science Rendezvous, which is the biggest individual one-day science event in Canada, and it is part of the broader Science Odyssey initiative of the federal government. Uh, in Canada, we really do support major science events. We like to promote uh, incredible people's work, uh, make sure that they have lots of avenues to share that work with a wide audience, and so that all comes together today uh, in this presentation with Lindsay Carmichael. So I've known her for years. She is a fantastic author, scientist, and more. She is going to do a little bit of a walk in the woods with us today, highlighting some of her stories from her new book, The Boreal Forest. We're going to talk together. If you're at home with a pen and paper and you want to draw uh, along with today's presentation, I really do encourage you to do so. And we're just going to tell some great stories and show a fun video to boot. So I hope that is as exciting to you as it is to me. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to blow our minds and take us away. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today and go for it. <laughs> thank you so much, Jesse. And hello, everybody from across Canada and the US. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. Um, I also have a very special guest here with me today. This is Fox Cousteau. Fox Cousteau is my author mascot. And as you can see, he is uh, very safety conscious. He's got his mask on today, as I know some of you probably do as well. Uh, Fox Cousteau is also a red fox. He is a red fox that loves to learn new things and explore and have adventures. And because red foxes are one of the species that lives in the boreal forest, he is extra excited to be here with all of us today learning about the boreal forest. So yes, as Jesse mentioned, I am a children's author. Um, this is my newest steam book for kids. It is The Boreal Forest, A Year in the World's Largest Land Biome. It's my 22nd book. It has gorgeous illustrations by Jose Bisseillon, and it's published by Kids Can Press, if you want to look for that in your local library. I am also the author of the free resource guide for the Million Tree Project, which is a brand new Canada-wide experiment brought to you by Science Rendezvous. And for those of you who are in the US, that's okay, you can totally take part in the Million Tree Project too. So the goal of the Million Tree Project is to spark a million conversations about forests and trees and their role in the environment and how they help to prevent climate change and all of the amazing things that they do for us and the planet. So you are participating in the Million Tree Project just by being here with me today, but we're gonna talk about some more ways that you can take action and get involved later on in the talk. So stay tuned for that. First, we are gonna get warmed up a little bit uh, with a bit of a discussion about the boreal forest biome and why it is special. The boreal forest, of course, based on the title of the book, is the world's largest land biome. Only the ocean biome is bigger. That means that the boreal forest is bigger than the tropical rainforest, even though the tropical rainforest tends to be a bit more famous. It is the most northern forest on the planet. If you keep going farther north, you run into the Arctic tundra where it's too cold and dry for trees to grow. And it's found in about a dozen countries in the northern parts of the planet, including Canada and Alaska in the USA. 29% of the boreal biome is right here in Canada, which is where I live. And it is by far the largest of the eight types of forests that we have here in Canada. If you're interested in the names and locations of the other forests, there's a really cool map here in this free resource guide, and you can get this in a print copy, or you can go to sciencerendezvous.ca and look at everything online for free as well, if you wanna check that out. Again, we're just gonna focus on the boreal forest today because it's my favorite. So what I wanted to do to get us all started in the mood, uh, was to read just a short section of the book to you, but I am not going to show you Jose's gorgeous illustrations. And that is because I want you to make your own illustrations. This is the point where you get to start getting involved and to draw your own pictures. So while you are listening to me read, what I want you to do 
is to grab your paper, your crayons, your pencil crayons, markers, modeling clay, if you would rather sculpt, that's cool too. And I want you to create a lovely piece of art that includes the kinds of trees that you think grow in the boreal forest. So grab those awesome art supplies. And here we go. Glaciers melt, soil breathes, seeds fly on a warming breeze. Trees creep ever, ever north. Centuries pass, climate changes. A forest is born. Welcome to the boreal forest. The boreal forest is young, less than 8,000 years old. Before then, during the ice age, glaciers covered much of North America, Europe, and Asia. As temperatures rose, the glaciers melted, retreating north. Animals that like cool climates walked, swam, or flew to the new lands exposed by the melting glaciers. Plants migrated by spreading their seeds. In the warmer, drier south, old trees died. But in the cool, wet north, their seedlings thrived. Over time, the forest continued to inch northward, eventually reaching its current location and the boreal forest as we know it came to be. Where is the boreal forest? The boreal forest is our planet's largest land-based biome. Also called taiga, the forest thrives in northern regions, forming a scarf around the neck of the world. 60% of the forest is in Russia, 29% is in Canada. Other cold northern areas, like Alaska and Scandinavia, also have boreal forests. There are many types of habitats in the biome. Diverse habitats provide homes for a diversity of species. There are birds in the trees and mammals in the bushes. There are fish and frogs in the rivers and the bogs. Some species stay all year, others only visit. Parts of the biome are so remote, few humans have ever seen them. But the boreal forest affects everyone. Its trees clean our air and its wetlands clean our water. The biome also slows global climate change. It is a vast and vital wilderness. Keep on drawing. I'm just gonna skip ahead to the middle of the book here, to the page where spring begins. That'll get us in the mood. It's spring where we all are, right? Okay, here we go. Near a lake, high in the mountains, spring sun warms a stately fir. Perched in its branches, a sable yawns, basking in the light. In the frozen soil, the tree's roots find only ice, but there's still a little moisture stored in its trunk. Water pumps from trunk to branch to twig to needle. The tree breathes in, waking from its winter slumber. The sun is higher now, the fur is getting hot. The water that cools the tree is almost gone. If it can't drink soon, it will die of thirst. But the days are getting longer and the snow has begun to melt power plants. Photosynthesis is a process that plants use to make food. First, their leaves inhale, absorbing carbon dioxide from the air. Inside the leaves, carbon dioxide combines with water and the sun's energy. This produces sugar, which gives plants the food energy they need to grow. Photosynthesis also produces oxygen, which plants exhale into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide that plants remove from the air ultimately becomes biomass, their living roots, stems, and leaves. By capturing and transforming carbon dioxide, plants slow climate change. Worldwide, boreal forests capture about 8.3 trillion kilograms, that's 18.3 trillion pounds, of carbon from the atmosphere each year. That's the weight of more than 50 million blue whales. Thirsty trees. In spring and summer, when the soil has thawed, plants absorb water through their roots. They use water for photosynthesis, but also to cool themselves. In their leaves, liquid water absorbs heat and turns into vapor. As plants exhale the vapor, they also release the heat. Sweaty humans cool off in a similar way. Movement of water from the soil through plants and into the atmosphere is called transpiration. One Norway spruce transpires up to 175 liters, 46 gallons, per day. Boreal transpiration is a major component of the global water cycle. Just to put that 175 liters into context for you, 
One human is supposed to drink two liters of water a day. I'm not sure what the uh, equivalent of that is for, for the Americans in the room, but um, trees drink way more water than humans do. Okay. If you didn't have time to finish your artwork, that's totally okay. You can keep working on it now if you want to, or you can put it aside and come back to it later. And I would like to invite the teachers and any parents that might be in the group um, to think about sharing the incredible art that your kids have just created with the Million Tree Project. So if you would like to do that, um, you can put photos of those amazing artworks onto social media using the hashtag Million Tree Project. You can go to sciencerendezvous.ca. There's a register your activity button on the Million Tree Project page, and you can actually click that and then tell us what you did, which is awesome. Or if you want to, you can take that photo and then email it to info at sciencerendezvous.org, and it can get added to the National Gallery of all of the incredible things that people are doing to talk about and learn about and conserve and plant trees in Canada and around the world. So those are some awesome ways that you can share your great art that you have just created. For right now, I just want to talk a little bit more about the content of those pictures that everybody was drawing. So how many people have drawn something that looks like a Christmas tree or a conifer? You can let me know in the chat. <laughs> I don't think we've got the live chat and we've got the YouTube chat. So if anyone was drawing, please do. I've got a bit of both. I've got some Christmas trees and then I've got some like some taller, thinner guys that sort of, I'm a terrible artist, but I try my best. So I'm, I'm no, I'm no boreal forest author, but I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat. Let us know if you guys have drawn any pictures and I'll share the answers with Lindsay. Yeah, so anything that looked like a conifer, and for anybody who maybe doesn't know this word conifer, the conifers are the trees that have the needles, and they're the ones that tend to keep those needles on their bodies all year round. So that's why we also sometimes call them evergreens. So I might need to get Jesse to help me out here um, with the chat box so that I can check your answers because, oh, Miss Gallant's class had some conifers, excellent. Ooh, evergreen trees from Kaylee, yeah, awesome, 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 okay. Now I would like you guys to tell me some examples of conifers. So what are some types of trees that are conifers? Some species names that you might know. Share those with us now. If I could cue up the Jeopardy theme music, I would now, but I don't actually have that in the backdrop. But guys, any ideas? Pine trees you got on YouTube from Mr. Oh. Aiden Parker, so that's a good pick. Excellent, yes. So pine trees are an excellent, very important component of the boreal forest for sure. Um, one species we have here in Canada is the jack pine. Um, and they're cool because like all pine trees, they keep their seeds inside cones and the cones are sealed with resin, which is like a glue. And the resin of the jack pine is so strong that it only melts in the heat of a forest fire. Um, so when the fire comes through the forest and it clears out space on the forest floor, that's when the seeds of the jack pine come out of that cone. And now they have all this lovely space where they can grow. Uh, so in the chat that I can see, I've got fir tree. Yes, somebody was paying attention when I was reading. That was the kind that was in the book for sure. Um, if you do celebrate Christmas, you may have had a fir tree in your very own living room. 13% of all of the Christmas trees sold in North America are actually balsam fir. Um, in the YouTube chat, Lindsay, we've got spruce, blue spruce, cedar, more fir, and uh, cypress. And so you can tell mm -hmm. me some of those maybe. Yeah, yeah. So black spruce is actually the most common tree species in the boreal forest of Canada, which is going to make it the most common tree species in all of Canada. Um, cedars grow in the boreal as well. Now, somebody mentioned cypress. They are actually evergreens, but they are um, a warmer climate tree. We don't get cypresses in the boreal forest, maybe in Florida, <laughs> but not in the boreal, but they're still pretty and they definitely count as evergreens. You were totally right. right. Um, there's one other boreal conifer that I love to mention, um, and I don't know if anybody came up with this one. In the eastern part of North America, we tend to call them larch. In the western part, we tend to call them tamarack. It's the same tree. Um, and the cool thing about this tree is that the needles actually turn yellow and fall off in the autumn, just the way the leaves of deciduous trees do, change color, fall down. The larch or the tamarack is the only conifer that does that, so that makes it kind of cool and special. Now, if you're picture that you drew has those leafy trees in it, things like poplar or aspen or maybe a paper birch with a lovely white trunk. Those are also very common boreal forest species. So good job for including those. Awesome. Okay. That's a little introduction to some of the awesome trees that live in the boreal forest. We're going to change gears in just a moment here, but I wanted to pause 
for a minute to see if there are any questions about anything we've talked about so far. We're going to do two questions now, and then we'll do more questions at the end. Okay, so that's perfect, guys. I'll give our teachers just a second to get that ready. I've been sharing all sorts of links in the chat. Uh, we know I just also put up in our, our YouTube chat, Larch Valley in Moraine Lake in Banff National Park is one of the most beautiful places in the world. If you want to see that yellow, incredible look in the fall, I really encourage our class to check that out. So I'm going to go to Miss Erickson. Uh, if you guys do have a question now, I know you guys are, are awfully on the ball. Let's unmute that microphone and come on in and share away. Lyndon, can you unmute your microphone and ask your question, please? The computer relay. <laughs> so, Ms. Erickson, if they are sharing it right now, we're not hearing it, just so you know. Okay, so Landon's asking about the nature walk. Go ahead, Landon. He wants to know what he's going to be doing on the nature walk. I don't know if you're able to hear that or not. Oh, okay. I gotcha. I, I think there may be a small amount of confusion about the title of the talk. Um, we're not actually leaving the house today. <laughs> so this is a metaphorical or a symbolic walk through the woods. We are exploring, but we are exploring by the seat of our pants in our chairs. <laughs> It's very, it's in our title. We like it. Um, <laughs> I like the spirit, Landon. And I think at the end of this broadcast, if you get a chance to go into the forest, you absolutely should because it is a magical place at all times of year. Yeah, um, do that. We've got a question from Mr. Malucci uh, on YouTube as well, which is what kind of animals depend on those trees in the boreal forest, Lindsay? Oh, well, you are actually ahead of us. That is our next topic. So I'm going to take advantage of this perfect, perfect segue to just move right along. And if anybody has more questions, save those. We'll have time at the end, I promise. Okay, now it is time to talk about those animals in the trees, in the boreal forest. So I'm just cleaning up my desk space here. So I've got some room to do this little brainstorming challenge with you. We are all going to do a 60 second brainstorming challenge together. I have got my timer here. It is already set for a minute. We're ready to go. When I start the timer, what I want you to do is grab your paper and your pencil or your pen, whatever you got handy, and write down as many types of animals as you can think of that live on or in a tree. So not necessarily in the forest as a whole, think about the animals that are on or in just one tree. Okay, everybody ready? Start, I'm gonna do it too. Whoops, there we go. Best answer on YouTube so far is the sloth panda, which is very rare, I hear. And <laughs> not existent, but very cool. <laughs> I've got like seven so far. This is intense, Lindsay. <laughs> this is awesome. We're going to talk about some of these answers when we're done. So keep them coming. Come on, guys. And that was 60 seconds. Wow, one minute goes by really fast when you're thinking, doesn't it? Totally, totally does. So this is my list. It's pretty long because, you know, I did all the research already. So I had a bit of a head start on everybody else. And I am much more interested in knowing some of the things that you came up with on your list. So we're going to talk about a few of those now. Um, so in the chat part that I can see here, um, I see from Mrs. Gallon's class, squirrels, yes, red squirrels, black squirrels, gray squirrels flying squirrels. There are flying squirrels in the boreal forest and they are super cute and cool. Um, bugs, yes. Yes, there are actually certain kinds of caterpillars like forest tent caterpillars or spruce budworm that can do a thing that we call outbreaking where their population increases to huge, huge numbers. Um, and they can actually strip the leaves off of millions of trees and cause a lot of damage um, to the forest. Um, and also make people really, really nervous when we're walking under the trees in case the caterpillars are gonna start falling down in our hair. <laughs> Anybody who's been through a forest tent caterpillar outbreak will remember that horrible sensation. Uh, what else have we got here in the chat box? Porcupine, yes. Porcupines are a boreal species as well. 
they eat trees. They actually chew on the bark and the leaves. So they climb up them, but porcupines are big and lumbering and kind of awkward. And one of the most common causes of injuries in porcupines is falling out of trees, if you can believe that. Uh, koala, yes, eucalyptus trees, tree frogs, sloth, owls, absolutely. Owls like to live in the holes in trees that woodpeckers have excavated by banging on that bark trying to get the bugs out. Uh, what have you got, Jesse? You know, so many on YouTube. Like it's just, I don't think we've ever had more engagement ever. A lot of the ones we've already covered, uh, we've got things that don't live in the trees, but live around the trees like bears, wolves, elk, moose. People are really familiar with our boreal species, which is really yes. Fun. Iconic uh, forest animals, yeah. We've got uh, squirrel uh, monkeys, which are, of course, not in our Canadian forest, to my knowledge. That would be pretty surprising. Um, <laughs> we've got bats and martens, which is pretty cool. I did yes. That. Yeah, so bats for sure. Pine martens, that's a North American species. That is, uh, it's right in the name. That one's kind of a gimme. Um, in the book, I mentioned the sable. It's a very similar species to the pine martin, but they don't live in North America. They live in Russia um, and uh, other parts of, of Asia and Europe. Um, panda, someone from Mrs. C's class said panda. And you're probably thinking about the bamboo. Here's a fun fact for you. Bamboo is not a tree, it's a grass. I know that's crazy, right? Because they're so enormous, those bamboo canes, but they're actually a really fast growing species of grass of all things. Um, so that one can be a bit confusing and I understand why you came up with panda for sure. Raccoons, absolutely. Um, possums, not so much in the boreal, but yeah, possums love trees and they're super cute too. Um, I think I may be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure possums are the only marsupial that we have here in North America, which makes them pretty cool too. To my knowledge, I've seen a few of them. Uh, they're very, very cool. If no one's ever seen an opossum, uh, go out at night. They're a really cool creature. I'm also so glad you mentioned the porcupine falling out of tree thing. It's so pitiful, but it's so cool. Their needles are sterile in part because when they fall, they get like hit by their needles and it would really infect them, which is a really odd fact. And they're, yeah, I think it's 30% of them have serious broken bone healing uh, things from falling out of trees. So, be less clumsy than a porcupine is a good thing <laughs> for life. <laughs> that, that, is, that is good advice for when you are taking your own nature walks actually out of your house into the forest. Um, while we're on the subject of like totally weird and bizarre animals that maybe are in trees that possibly shouldn't be, um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the animal that surprised me the most when I was doing my research for this book. Um, the tree dwelling animal that surprised me the most was the Chinese merganser. The reason it surprised me is because it's a duck. Yes, you heard me correctly. The Chinese merganser is a duck. And it spends most of its time in the water like the rest of the ducks, but mergansers are what's known as cavity nesting ducks. They are building their nests inside those holes in the hollowed out trees, just the way owls do. Which leads us to the question, how do the ducklings get out of the tree and into the water? So I'm going to share a video with you now um, because it is absolutely unbelievable and it's so much more fun than listening to me tell this to you. We're just we're just going to watch it instead because it's incredible. You're going to love this. Okay, let me uh, click on over to the video. We'll bump that to full screen so it looks nice and big for you. And here we go. <laughs> Hatching is underway. The nest is a busy place and noisy. All that vocalizing promotes a family bond as the ducklings get used to the sound of their mother's voice. She won't stay in the nest for long, though. Within hours of the last egg hatching, the ducklings are home alone. Their mother's not far away, and her calls are the only thing that could entice them to abandon their cozy nest. Barely a day old, they can't fly up to the entrance, so instead, they climb. They're equipped with strong claws just for this purpose. When they reach 
reached the opening, the first view of the outside world must come as quite a shock. It's a five-story drop. But somewhere down below, their mom is urging them to leave the only home they know, so they can live the life they were born for. And that persuades them to do something that seems a little crazy. Some ducklings aren't as bold as others. And he who hesitates gets a push. Finally, driven by instinct and joined to one another by an inseparable bond, they all take the plunge. begins her nest with a I love this video <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I've watched it it is just the most incredible thing I have ever seen on the internet is these rainy downing ducklings just falling from the sky um, now we talked about porcupines hurting themselves so if you were at all concerned about the ducklings don't worry they're okay they are so much lighter and fluffier than porcupines that they do not hurt themselves when they hit the forest floor. They just bounce a little bit and then they get up and they waddle down to the water and go find their mom. So it's totally okay. Now you probably guessed from the name of the duck, the Chinese merganser. We do not have them here in North America. However, we do have a number of species of cavity nesting ducks right here at home. So I totally encourage all of you to go to your library if it's safe or check out online, see if you can do some research to learn about the cavity nesting duck species in North America. And while you are at it, don't forget to look up more cool information about the other animals that you had on your list as well. All right. There's one more thing that I wanted to talk to you all about today, and then we're gonna get into the questions. And this is where we're coming back around to making the connection between trees and forests and climate and the Million Tree Project. You might not remember too many of the details while I was reading because you were all busy drawing, and that's totally okay. But trees can help slow down climate change, and that is because of a very special role that they play in the carbon cycle. If you want a lot of detail on the carbon cycle, there's tons of information in the boreal forest. Um, and there's also lots of good information in that free resource guide for the Million Tree Project, which again, you can get online at sciencerendezvous.ca if you wanna check that out. Today, we're just gonna cover the basics, okay? So the carbon cycle is a natural process and it describes all of the ways that the element carbon transforms from being a gas up in the atmosphere to the solid carbon compounds that make up the bodies of living things and then back into gases in the atmosphere. And when we talk about climate change, the gas that we are usually talking about is carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's one of the gases that can help the Earth's atmosphere um, hold heat against the planet. Um, and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means the warmer the planet gets overall. So in the carbon cycle, that balance of carbon that's going up versus carbon that's coming down is really important because that's how the planet keeps a stable climate. There are three ways of carbon going up into the atmosphere. One of them is something that we are all doing right now. It's called respiration or breathing. When we exhale, carbon dioxide leaves our bodies, it goes up into the atmosphere. Another way is decomposition. When living things break down after death, the carbon compounds in their bodies turn back into carbon dioxide gas, go up into the atmosphere. And the third one is combustion. We talked about combustion a little bit already today. In nature, it usually means forest fire or grass fire, um, but it can also refer to when human beings are burning fossil fuels for energy, which makes sense because fossil fuels are made up of ancient plants and animals. So they are chock full of carbon just like living plants and animals are, right? 
So that's three ways that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up. In contrast, nature only has one way to get that carbon dioxide back down out of the atmosphere, and that is through photosynthesis, which trees and other green plants are doing all around us all the time. So what happens is the trees are breathing in that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they're combining it with water from the soil that they're drinking up through their roots and some energy from the sun, and they're turning it into the sugar that becomes the fuel for life and turns into all of those other carbon compounds that make up their bodies. And that also, coincidentally, feed the herbivores, which feed the carnivores, which keeps the whole food chain on the planet going at the same time. So this is why planting trees is such a powerful thing that we can do to help slow down the pace of climate change. And it's why tree planting is one of the cornerstones of the Million Tree Project. If that sounds like something that you want to do and you need some help getting started and figuring out how and where and why to plant your tree, um, there are tons of free resources online at sciencerendezvous.ca. So in addition to the guide, you're going to find um, online references and resources and lesson plans there as well, which you are welcome to check out for more information on how to go about that. Not everybody can plant a tree, and if you can't, that's totally okay. There are lots and lots of other ways that you can take action and participate in the Million Tree Project as well. One of them is doing what we're doing right now, just talking about trees and learning about trees and forests and why they matter. Another really powerful way to take part is to protect and preserve and conserve the trees and forests that we already have. So before we get into the questions today, I thought it might be nice for us to take a few minutes together to brainstorm some of the things that we can do to protect the trees that we already have in our environment. So this is another chance for all of you watching today to share some of your ideas, either in the private chat or on YouTube, whatever is going to work for you. What are some things that we can do to help protect and conserve the trees we've already got growing out there in those wonderful forests? Share your ideas. Fantastic, guys. So yes, you guys know the drill. We've had almost more engagement for this one than we have for any 10 programs. So it's been really exciting already. Please do share those ideas. And then we're going to dive in for about 10 minutes of Q&A. So excited to hear your questions. We've already got some teachers pouring in with them. And we've got our first thing, Stop Littering from Ms. Gallant's class, which is a great idea just in general. Uh, yes. Too. But I'll keep sharing things as they pop up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, trying not to litter is a very, very important thing um, for nature and conservation in general, because we know that wild animals will eat some of the things that we are leaving out there, which is not great. Um, and when it comes to littering cigarette butts, that is one of the ways forest fires start. So it's very, very important that anything that could catch on fire is not put outside um, where it could set those trees on fire and start those forest fires. Um, Mrs. Erickson's class says recycle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we were all like working on paper earlier today. And as a writer, that's something I do a lot. I print out my manuscripts and I make corrections by hand and then I type them back in. Um, but what I always do is save my stack of paper and then write all over the backside. And once I've used both sides of those paper, um, as best I, I can, that's when it goes in the recycling bin. So I'm trying to use that tree product as much as I possibly can so that I don't have to buy new things made of trees. Well, I'm getting way more things <laughs> popping up in the chat. I can see here, Carlene is saying, stop cutting down healthy trees. Yeah, here's, here's the tricky thing about cutting down trees. There are a ton of things that we as humans need to survive that actually come from trees. Um, so paper we just talked about, we need paper for all kinds of things. Um, bathroom products like tissues that you blow your nose on. Um, lumber that we use to build our houses. These are things that certainly in Canada, we kind of have to have because we wouldn't be able to survive up here in the cold if we didn't have houses that were built of wood. Mm -hmm. um, so the important thing when it comes to cutting down trees is to try to do it in a sustainable way. So we talk about sustainable forestry. And what that means is harvesting trees in a way that is going to make sure that there's plenty of time and opportunity for the forest to regenerate and rebuild itself before it gets harvested again. And that can be a natural regeneration process. The boreal forest in particular is sort of adapted to recover after an insect outbreak or a forest fire or something else that kills trees, it comes back. Or it could be getting out there and planting trees and giving it a little head start, right? 
So if you're interested in learning more about sustainable forestry, the Canadian Forest Service and Natural Resources Canada has tons of information on that. Um, I'm not sure what the equivalents in the US are, but I know you can figure that out um, just with some Googling. Um, and you can look for things like forest, um, I can never remember the names of them, forest sustainable certifications. There's a couple of different organizations that actually certify paper and wood products to let you know that they come from forests that have been harvested sustainably. So you can look for that as well. Uh, Jesse, was there something you wanted to add? I saw you yeah. pop on there. Well, I just said we have so many on YouTube as well. We've got things about uh, reducing fossil fuel consumption, riding your bike and walking to work or school, which is great. The other day we did Parks Canada programs and one of the big things they emphasize to keep the ecosystem healthy is to stay on the trail. These are really special. Mm. So make sure that you're not just tramping around through woods because you want to keep those ecosystems intact and all those things really do make a positive difference. Uh, I also, with certification, FSC certified is, is sort of the standard biggest one. Uh, FSC certification, you'll see this on paper sometimes, a little green logo, um, and that really helps you make sustainable choices when it comes to your wood products. So very cool. Yes, awesome. Um, in the chat that I can see here, I've, I've, I've got a couple of comments from classes about planting the trees, but also making sure they grow properly, um, which is actually a really important point. And that's something that's covered in the tree planting information in the guide. Um, the best tree in the world is going to die if you put it in the wrong habitat. So it's important to plant that tree in a place where that tree is going to thrive, where it's got good soil and the right amount of water and sunlight. Um, and there's tons of awesome information that you can find online um, or you can talk to somebody who um, who might want to sell you that tree right somebody at the nursery where you're going to buy your seedling um, is going to help you figure out how to care for that tree and give it the best chance of actually growing up and to be a giant giant tree um, oh and mrs gallant's class is also mentioning the emerald ash borer yes so the emerald ash borer has been a huge outbreak species more in the US than here in Canada. I think it's a bit more Southern. We haven't really seen it as much in Canada, um, but it is one of those insects like the spruce budworm that can um, outbreak to enormous proportions and it can kill a lot of trees. So something that we talk about a lot, and you may have seen these signs if you are one of those people that likes to go camping with your family, the signs that talk about not transporting firewood across state lines or across province lines, because what you might be doing accidentally is taking wood from a place that's having an insect outbreak into a place that doesn't have that insect yet, except now it does. So being really careful to follow those guidelines about the transport of wood when you're out camping or, or hiking makes a big, big difference in, in our ability to protect the trees that we have. These are fabulous ideas. Jesse, I see you popping back on here. Do we have questions? Uh, to get I would to? Love, I'd love to dive in with questions. We've got about 10 minutes or so, and there's so many, I mean, there's more answers than we could possibly shake a stick at. And it's been really fantastic to see on YouTube and with our live classes. You guys are so engaged, so involved. It's so neat that this generation that, you know, the kids are so, you know, I think everyone had thought it was going to be my generation that was going to be the big one for, for doing ecosystem awareness and health. And it's really, it's you guys. It's the kids in these classrooms today. And I think that's evident in all these amazing answers that have been shared today. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I mean, I remember I was in the seventh grade before I had even heard the word environment. It was not something people of our age ever talked about. Okay. And now kids that are that age are like out there making a difference. And that is so encouraging and wonderful to see. I love it. It is so fantastic, guys. And yeah, I want to dive into questions, give you guys the chance to uh, share with Lindsay what you think. If you have any pictures that you want to show on screen too, you're welcome to. Of course, social media as well. Million Tree Project is a great way to do that. But I want to go to Miss Russett's class. And Miss Russett's class is joining us today in uh, McNabb or Brayside uh, Public School. So welcome in, guys in Ontario. You guys want to come in and kick us off with a question? Go for it. Hi there. Uh, we're wondering, how did you first become interested in learning about the boreal forest? Oh, excellent question. Um, so I am a scientist by training. Um, so I've always been really, really passionate about nature and the environment, although I did focus on the Arctic when I was uh, doing my scientific research. Um, the idea for this book actually came from my editor at the publishing house. Her name is Katie Scott, and she's a wonderful person. And she read an article about the boreal forest. I think it was 30 cool facts about the boreal forest. And she thought, you know what? This is an incredibly important biome um, not just, you know, here in Canada, but for all of the things that it does for the world in general, not just with carbon cycle and climate, but for water as well. Um, this would be a great thing for kids to know about because kids know about the tropical rainforest, but not as many know about the boreal forest. So she approached me and I thought, you know what, you're 100% correct. This is such an important ecosystem. People need to know about it. Not to mention the fact some of the animals that live there are amazing and cool. We mentioned some of the iconic species, but there are some wacky weird ones too. And I love writing about 
the weird and wacky and wonderful things out there in the natural world. So that makes sense to me. <laughs> Great question to kick us off, guys. Uh, let's head to New York, Pearl Palmer Elementary, and Miss C's class. If you guys want to unmute your mic, come on in, take us away. Hi, Jesse. Um, Kaylee's going to ask a question, and I think she said she wants to show her picture. Oh, oh awesome. Cool. Okay, go ahead, Kaylee. <laughs> No. Are there any invasive species in the boreal forest? And if so, what are they? Yeah. Oh, good question. Are there any invasive species in the boreal forest? And if so, what are they? Um, so this was something that came up when I was doing my research. And I believe there are about 1,500 different invasive species in the boreal forest. Um, we obviously cannot talk about all of them today. Two of them that are a little bit surprising are earthworms and pine beetles. So pine beetles have moved from southern forests north into British Columbia and across into Alberta um, because of climate change, because winters are not as cold as they used to be. And more of those beetles are surviving over the winter and are able to live farther north than they used to live. And there aren't a lot of natural defenses in the boreal forest against these beetles because they're not normally there. So that's an invasive species that people in the western parts of Canada have been talking about a lot and doing a lot of research on to try and control those. The earthworms is a weird one too because we usually think about worms in the soil being a good thing. Um, but worms can actually eat all of the leaves that have fallen to the forest floor and clear that soil in less than five years. And what that does, it is it affects the way the rain soaks into the soil, it affects how quickly the soil dries out, and that can have huge, huge impacts on the plants that are growing in the forest, um, which then of course affects the animals that can live there as well. Um, we're not entirely sure how earthworms got to the boreal forest, um, but one idea scientists have is that they may have actually been dumped by people who were out fishing and they had leftover bait. So that is obviously not a good idea. <laughs> Do not introduce new invasive species to the boreal forest or any other ecosystem. Stay on those paths, dispose of your garbage properly, all the things we already talked about. Yeah, so that's two of the most important ones there. I'd never heard that story before. That's very cool. And I also, I, I'm a huge earthworm nerd because for backyard bio, especially literally get out like any day at night with a flashlight hovered over the ground, pretty much anywhere in North America. And you will have earthworms pop back into their burrows to avoid that light. Um, it's also Charles Darwin's last full book talking about the impact of something very small over a long period of time, which is yeah. sort of a shtick um, uh, is on earthworms and how cool they are. So great question, guys. Um, all right, let's take a question from Ms. Gallant's class, joining us in Guelph, Ontario, uh, holding up two computers. That's been a tough run for you, uh, but unmute your mic and you're good to go. <laughs> Hi, here we are from St. Francis. I, um, my name is also Lindsay, so I was a little bit confused sometimes <laughs> when Jesse was Lindsay. All right, so I have some kids on here. Um, we were really uh, spending a lot of time like talking about the emerald ash borer because a lot of the trees in our area have been cut down. I don't know, Ellie, did you want to show the picture, like show your backyard? She does, okay. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you can see very well. Yeah, Just trying to show her backyard cool. there. What a cool backyard. <laughs> but it used to be full of trees. It used to be full and of now, trees. now there's not as many trees, obviously, um, <laughs> because, uh, because they've been cut down. So it, it's hard to see that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, it's especially if you're a person like me that that feels um, more peaceful and calm when surrounded by trees, as many people do, um, to watch them get cut down is, is really, really awful. Um, but yeah. the problem with some of those diseases and some of those insects is that they are so good at killing the trees that the only way to protect the trees that aren't infected yet is to just get rid of the ones that are. Which is, which is tough. And I know with the emerald ash borer, um, part of the trouble with ash trees is that some of them only produce seeds every five or seven years. I may have that wrong. It's been a while since I researched that. So you might wanna Google it to make sure. But some trees produce seeds every year and some trees only do it once in a while. And ash is one of those species that takes a while to reproduce. So um, that makes it, it's gonna make it harder for those trees to recover um, from, from that outbreak of, of, of insects. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a tough and tricky thing, and there are always these these compromises that that have to get made, um, considering the system as a whole, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Ms. Galstad, did you guys have a question outside of that or just want to show us off and, and tell us a little bit about what you're talking about? If you have a question, you're welcome to it, and then we'll do our two more classes. Awesome. Before we wrap up. Does any, Sydney, did you want to ask a question? Oh, page unresponsive. Okay, I'll ask a question. Sure. We were wondering um, how far north, like where is the boreal, boreal forest in terms of how far north and how far south here? Mm, okay, so um, the best place to go for that answer is going to be uh, probably this map in the middle of the free guide, um, because that's going to show the locations of all of the forest regions in Canada. So all of the, the forest that you can see in the three different kinds of green, that's all boreal. Um, so I'm here in, in Trenton in southern Ontario. Um, this is a little bit too far south for the boreal. Um, and it's mostly in the more northern parts of Canada. And I'm not sure if I can hold this endpoint at the same time. But it kind of goes um, across. And then in the western part, it goes up. So it's not like you get to a certain level of north and then it just stops. It kind of curls um, up through the Yukon and then across into Alaska. But most of the Northwest Territories and all of Nunavut are tundra. There's no trees there. So um, that is um, a habitat that's sort of balanced both by climate and by how much water there is. There's a certain amount of rainfall that the trees need to grow as well. And um, those patterns vary from east to west in Canada as well as from north and south. So pictures online, that's the bottom line. <laughs> I remember diagrams like that when I was in school. I always loved things like that, and maps and, and things. So that's very cool to get a chance to show that. Um, Ms. Lavalie, I know you're in the background. So if you do want to let me know if you have a question, uh, by all means, I know your devices are off right now, but I will go to Ms. Erickson in Stafford Springs, Connecticut. If you guys want to come in for one, just unmute that mic and you're good to go. Your question? Carmen's going to ask a question. Okay. Great. And again, I think we won't be able to hear it through your computer, but. So how many snake species in the boreal forest, if there are any? A snake question. Thank you so much for that. Oh, this is a good question. Reptiles are actually the rarest group of species in the boreal forest. There are very, very few of them. I think maybe like one or two snakes at the most, mostly in the southern part. Um, and that's because the forest is cold <laughs> um, in the winter it can get down to, you know, minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is also minus 40 Fahrenheit for the Americans in the room. Um, and that is really, really cold for a reptile because of course reptiles are cold blooded. Their body temperature matches the temperature of their environment. So even if they're burrowed underground, um, there's not a lot of underground to get to because the soil um, in a lot of the boreal forest is permafrost, meaning that it's frozen all year, except for that very top layer in the spring. Um, so it's really hard for the reptiles to escape and to stay warm enough to survive the winter. Um, one cool adaptation that some of the frogs, the amphibians in the boreal forest have, is that they can actually freeze solid and then thaw in the spring and just like hop away like nothing ever happened. So Google wood frogs, they're incredible. So yeah, cool question. Yeah, not a lot of reptiles in the boreal forest. I'm so glad you mentioned wood frogs. They are the most amazing animal. Uh, in fact, there's a new Attenborough series, BBC out called Perfect Planet. There's a whole episode with a ton of Canadian stories of wildlife, uh, sort of dealing with the cold, dealing with the changes in seasons. Uh, so I really encourage you guys to check out Perfect Planet. It is cool. so amazing. Uh, Lindsay, time flies and you're having fun and we're already rebels going overtime. So what I'm gonna do is highlight a few quick resources people can use to keep the learning going. Uh, you shared so much today and then we'll do a, a farewell at the end of that, if that all sounds good. Awesome books, for one thing. Check out the Boreal <laughs> Forest. Lily, you said 22 books you've written, which is crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Where do you find the time? Uh, but do check out Lindsay. Her website is here, by the way. So lecarmichael.ca. Check that out. There's so many amazing resources there. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Million Tree Project, of course, check out hashtag Million Tree Project. Check out scienceRendezvous.ca. All these ways that you can share your own tree pictures like some of our students did today. And it's very, very cool. Of course, our project at uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is Backyard Bio. Uh, the team at Science Rendezvous is involved with this as well. We've got partners all around the world. We'd love to get you guys out exploring trees creatures that are locally in your forest nearby or whatever else you can discover. And then if you want to see that duckling video, that delightful duckling video, like a hundred times in a row after this, uh, it's a little unwieldy. I put it in the YouTube chat as well. And any teacher that wants, I'll make sure that they have that link uh, as well. So Lindy, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate you sharing all these great stories. 
<laughs> oh, my pleasure. This has been so much fun. And thank you to all of the classes who joined us. You were so engaged and you had brilliant ideas and great questions. And that makes my job so much easier. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, our groups on YouTube, over 13 full classes. So well over 300 kids there. We've got our live groups. I'm going to bring them in to say a quick farewell. That's how we end every broadcast. So Miss Erickson, Miss C, Miss Gallon's class. If you guys want to join me and say,